Hi, it's Tom here from Running Physio. Uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about hip dysplasia, which is actually one of those conditions which is surprisingly um, difficult to spot um, and as you'll see in a little while can take quite a while to diagnose but will be there in quite a few patients that we see in clinic. Now I recognize for me this was an area I wanted to learn more so I've dived into the research and I'm going to summarize some of the findings uh, from that in this video to help you to spot hip dysplasia in patients that you see in clinic. Um, I'm going to also in the comments uh, add some of the key research papers that I've identified so you can explore in more detail. I'm from an expert in this topic so I want to give you the opportunity to find out more as I've done. Now we've also got our, our free uh, running injury videos including videos on uh, shin pain assessment and treatment and I've included a link for that as well so do check those out lots of gems in there for you to use in clinic with your patients. So let's start with some surprising uh, information that I found out from some of the literature that I was reading. So we think that hip dysplasia is prevalent in approximately a third of patients with hip pain that are presenting in primary care. And yet in one study, it found an average of around five years to diagnose. So it, it may actually be quite common, um, but missed. It's not something we necessarily always suspect. And yet it can lead to significant limitations for patients, pain with activity, pain with walking and limping in some cases as well. So it can have quite a big impact uh, on people's lives. So let's have a look at some of the common presenting features to help you to spot it. So hip dysplasia um, is typically going to be seen in a young female patient with an insidious onset. They're frequently going to describe groin pain, maybe with some lateral hip pain as well. Now we can think of a number of different pathologies that might present in this way, uh, but these would be some of the key signs. It's often aggravated by walking, running and impact. It may also be aggravated by pivoting movements and prolonged positions like sitting in some patients. Now, probably one of the most useful tests that we have uh, would be the FIDIRS test, which this is likely to be positive in most patients with hip dysplasia. So depending on the research you look at, uh, Nunley et al. found 97% of patients had pain with the flexion adduction internal rotation test, uh, or a larger review more recently found about 58% do. Now, of course, this doesn't tell you that it's definitely dysplasia. You can also get pain from other uh, areas. You can get um, femoral acetabular impingement will also be a positive with FIDIRS, um, but it, it may add uh, to your suspicion. Now, approximately 80% of patients with hip dysplasia are going to have mechanical symptoms of catching, clicking, locking, or popping. They may describe that the hip feels unstable. So again, that should lean you towards considering this as a diagnosis. And it seems that the left hip is more commonly affected than the right. Now, when we think about what hip dysplasia is, uh, it's, it's a lack of coverage of the femoral head from the acetabulum. So actually that may lead to increased range of movement at the hip rather than decreased range. So that might be a key differential between hip dysplasia and uh, femoral acetabular impingement where we often see reduction in internal rotation or flexion. And it may be associated with hypermobility. So looking at our more broad tests of hypermobility can be useful as well because if you've got that, that combination perhaps of some dysplasia and some general hypermobility, that's going to affect the, the stability at the hip. There may also be a family history of hip pain or dysplasia as well, so important to gather that family history. Now, there are uh, some tests that have been looked at uh, by Ryman et al. in 2019, looking at tests of instability and dysplasia. So they may have positive uh, tests with the prone instability test or the hyperextension external rotation test or abduction hyperextension external rotation test. Um, and I, I look at, look at uh, Mike Ryman's work for a little bit more information on that. So if you have a, a, a young 
female patient that's presenting to you in clinic with groin pain, maybe a bit of lateral hip pain as well. If it's brought on by walking, running, an impact. If they've got a positive for Deers test, but they don't seem to have a limit in range. In fact, they seem to be perhaps a bit hypermobile. Those things should be, you know, waving a flag and, and leaning you towards dysplasia as a possible diagnosis, particularly if they have a previous family history. Uh, it can impact on activities like walking. Sometimes it can lead people to reduce their hip extension in walking and running because that's a position that often feels unstable for them. So you might see that if you're analyzing um, their movement patterns potentially. Now, one thing that we often see in, in runners, which is obviously my specialist area, is a lot of them are diagnosed with hip flexor tendon pain. We know this can be a bit of a red herring for, for things like femoral neck stress fractures, but it's also a bit of a red herring for dysplasia too. Now, a recent research from Jacobson et al. looked at the prevalence of um, muscle or tendon-related pain in people with dysplasia, and they found approximately half the patients with hip dysplasia may have iliopsoas-related pain. So it's likely to be secondary to the dysplasia. So we have this, this uh, phrase that uh, Dr. James Noakes made popular, is never the hip flexor. And this is another example of where in runners in particular, um, we know it's rarely the hip flexor in isolation. There can be other underlying pathologies. So if you've got someone presenting with hip flexor related pain, again, that fits some of those characteristics we've talked about, there may be some underlying dysplasia of the hip that's leading to some irritation. Also, hip abductor related pain was also quite common in these patients too. So we do see this around the hip that one pathology often then presents with others um, or pain in the surrounding area and that can make the diagnosis a little bit more tricky. So we've got some of the key um, features there for you to identify. Let's compare it to some other causes of pain around the hip region just so we can you know help with the differential diagnosis. So if we think then, if we're comparing um, hip dysplasia versus gluteal tendinopathy. Now, gluteal tendinopathy can present with pain in the lateral hip, although pain may be less commonly in the groin. So if we compare the two with uh, hip dysplasia, it's typically younger female patients. Uh, so I believe none near till the average age was about 24. With gluteal tendinopathy, it's more common in women over 50. I believe it's been found to affect about one in four women over the age of 50. So slightly different um, patient demographics. With hip dysplasia, it's going to be predominantly groin pain, possibly with lateral hip pain too, whereas gluteal tendinopathy is predominantly lateral hip pain, although there are studies showing that you can have spread of symptoms into different areas. Unfortunately, of course, with diagnosis, it's never as clear cut as you think. With hip dysplasia, we would expect a positive for deers, sometimes positive in gluteal tendinopathy because we're combining flexion and adduction, but we'd be more expecting uh, positive uh, faders, so flexion, adduction, external rotation test, or doing things like your sustained single leg balance or palpation of the gluteal tendon, more likely to be positive in a pure gluteal tendinopathy. With hip dysplasia, we might have these mechanical signs and symptoms like feelings of instability, cl uh, clicking or locking, etc. But just to muddy the waters, you can have this coexisting tendon pain that's quite common. So probably one of the key things there will be the age demographic. We do see tendon pathology in younger patients uh, with hip pain, but it is probably more likely to be the older demographic there. Now, what about uh, femoral neck stress fracture then? We talked a little bit about this. And now, now, when I was putting this together, I was actually surprised how much overlap in symptoms there are. So if we, we look at hip dysplasia and femoral neck stress fracture side by side, in both, they're more common in females. Uh, Nunnally Tools paper, 72% of the patients with hip dysplasia were female in that study. And we know generally stress fractures are more common in female runners than male runners. Both can present with groin pain, uh, but you can have spread of symptoms in both, perhaps lateral hip pain with a dysplasia, but also potentially thigh pain with a femoral neck stress fracture. 
And both actually can have a positive Fideas test, a positive flexion, adduction, internal rotation test. I think perhaps your mechanical symptoms like the locking and instability we've talked about are going to be more common in dysplasia due to the nature of the pathology. Um, but both can have coexisting muscle and tendon pain. Again, hip flexor tendon pain is quite common in people with a femoral neck stress fracture. So really, if that's presenting in a, in a runner, you need to be considering what's driving it, what's underneath that. Both can be aggravated by walking, impact, and running. It's load-bearing stuff that tends to irritate femoral neck stress fractures and also seems to be painful in dysplasia. And both can have night pain. Nunley at all reported about 59% of patients in their study of dysplasia had night pain, which we know can be a feature of stress fractures as well. Now, one difference um, uh, that you might uh, be able to find on examination in hip dysplasia, you may have apprehension or instability in end range extension positions that you wouldn't necessarily expect in a femoral neck um, stress fracture. So things like the prone instability test may be positive. There may be symptoms in uh, extension, perhaps with walking and running, as we've touched upon. And with the femoral neck stress fractures, you probably would expect the impact tests so jogging on the spot, jumping in place, or the hop test to be immediately fairly provocative, particularly in the more severe cases. So this might help you a little bit with your differential uh, diagnosis between the two, but certainly there's quite a lot of overlap in terms of the patients. Now, if in doubt, particularly with femoral neck stress, neck stress fractures, we recommend urgent investigation. An x-ray um, can help to identify dysplasia or femoral neck stress fracture, although it's not particularly good at picking up stress fractures. Um, but an MRI would be the gold standard for assessment of bone stress injury. So if in doubt, get these checked out. For differentiation, maybe have a think about the kind of causative factors. So training load, um, in femoral neck uh, stress fractures. You, you're not likely to pick up a stress fracture without a reasonable training load there. And do they have bone stress injury risk factors? Do they have low BMI or low energy availability? Have they had a previous bone stress injury? Um, if so, that would certainly raise my suspicion of a, of a new stress fracture. And then with the hip dysplasia, if they're generally hypermobile, if they have a family history of dysplasia or hip pain, um, if they have those positive instability tests that we've been talking about, that again should lean us a little bit more to, towards dysplasia. Um, and I think if you suspect dysplasia, it, it is, I think, appropriate to, to go on to look at um, the next steps in terms of investigation, possibly with X-ray or MRI, um, to learn a little bit more uh, about the condition to help confirm the diagnosis. Um, so hopefully that's been useful to give you some of the key features of dysplasia. Uh, as I said, it's something that I'm learning about. Um, I'm going to be looking at recording more uh, content on this uh, for you, looking at different types of dysplasia, looking at treatment options as well for you. So keep a lookout for those as well. Speedy recap of what we've said. If you have a patient coming to clinic, particularly a younger female patient with um, anterior groin pain, maybe lateral hip pain uh, as well, if they don't seem to have limited range, perhaps they seem to have excessive range uh, in the hip, um, perhaps previous history of um, hypermobility, these things should be making you consider um, dysplasia, particularly if they've got mechanical symptoms like instability, clock. Uh, uh, clicking, locking, managed to combine the two words together there into clocking, new word. So if they've got clicking, locking, uh, instability, any of those features um, should lead you to suspect dysplasia as a potential option. Okay, thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, if you've got any questions about this, any comments, any cases you've seen, please let us know in the replies. And as I said, uh, I put a link to our other running injury content. Do check that out. I'm sure you'll find it really helpful. Okay, thanks again for listening. Bye for now.